Hello, everyone, and thank you so much to the Cybersight um, team for allowing me to present uh, today in this uh, webinar. And uh, the topic will be diabetic retinopathy, advanced clinical techniques and diagnosis for patients uh, monitoring and management. I'm Dr. Rosa Dolz Marco, and I'm a retina specialist working in Oftalbist Clinic in Valencia in Spain. And uh, I hope we can learn together uh, throughout the following uh, minutes. And the first thing we have uh, to really remember is that um, diabetes is currently a problem worldwide. It's increasing its prevalence uh, year after year. And uh, now with the 10th edition of the IDF uh, Diabetic Atlas, uh, they have even uh, increased the number of prediction for uh, diabetic number of patients in uh, uh, 2045. Right now we have about 537 million people worldwide uh, with diabetes. And uh, this is going to keep increasing as I was mentioning. But the problem is that um, it's increasing in a different way, depending on the area we see. If you see Europe, it's going to increase about 13% in the next 20 to 25 years. But if we look to Africa, for example, it's really impressive because uh, it's expected to be increasing about 134%. So that's a big issue uh, for those countries. And the other problem is that right now about 10% of the population, adult population worldwide is suffering diabetes, but almost half of these 10% uh, is unaware of this condition. So that's a big issue, uh, especially uh, for the screening uh, of this population and the diagnosis uh, and treatment. And we are going to discuss these things uh, later on. By 2045, the number of uh, adults with uh, diabetes is going to be expected to be about uh, 783 million, uh, and uh, that's about one in eight adults uh, worldwide. And those were the numbers for diabetes itself. The numbers for diabetic retinopathy, it, they are of course, they are going to increase uh, itself. About 35% of those uh, diabetic people, they are going to develop any uh, degree of diabetic retinopathy. And uh, about 11% of this population is going to develop sight-threatening uh, uh, conditions. So uh, they are going to decrease the vision. And the problem is that maybe those are the ones that are going to really go to the optician or the op ophthalmologist in order to check up the vision. But many of those without signs, they are not going to uh, show up early. Those were the global numbers, but I work in Spain and this is a quite recent work uh, by colleagues in my country in Spain. And it's uh, true that the uh, prevalence of diabetes mellitus uh, is going to increase. That's the blue bar that you see up in the graph. And uh, as seen uh, worldwide, it's increasing. But if you see the prevalence of uh, diabetic retinopathy, it's decreasing, uh, starting more or less about 28. Why is that? Why uh, in Spain is decreasing the number of cases? Well. The first thing is that we have improved the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. Uh, now with uh, primary care, it's uh, really uh, checking and screening diabetes mellitus. Also, we diagnose diabetes mellitus diabetes before in earlier stages. So a lot of patients that we are diagnosing now, they don't have any complication of the diabetes right now at the diagnosis. So that's why the numbers uh, vary a little bit. Also, because with the screening protocols that we have uh, right now working, the detection of diabetic retinopathy, it's also becoming earlier and earlier because uh, these screening uh, uh, protocols with technicians performing the, uh, the photographs and then uh, sending to general practitioners, it's quite working quite well. 
And also, and not least important, uh, um, we have better treatments for the systemic and glycemic control of these patients. So my first point that uh, I want to uh, highlight is that, okay, we have a lot of diagnostic tools, we have a lot of cool cameras and a lot of technology, but without a good work and multi-especially multi uh, collaboration, we cannot really diagnose early the diabetes. So we need endocrinology, primary care, uh, working together with us. And also we need to focus in patient education because if we want to really those patients to become um, part of the screening, they need to be informed and they need to understand the uh, importance of an early diagnosis. What about uh, screening? If you're really interested in a screening itself. I really recommend this paper by, uh, by Dr. Ramasamy. Um, um, it's a review in India of the screening uh, procedures, but I think it was really good because it summarizes a lot of the concepts of the screening. The first thing is that you can, for example, do a screening in an opportunistic way while they are uh, going to the endocrinology or the primary care um, um, checkup, they can also do the screening for uh, the retina, but you can also uh, schedule a systematic screening for all the patients that are being diagnosed of diabetes. The other point is that we have many, many options. We have traditional cameras, um, normally 45 to 50 degrees, but also wide field and ultra wide field imaging but also we have a smartphone based fundus cameras or handheld cameras. That's really important because sometimes we are not really doing the screening in the same place every day. So that's a good option for those uh, more mobile um, screening sets. <clears throat> of course, screening has a lot of challenges. First, we already mentioned, we don't have early symptoms in diabetic retinopathy. So patients may show up only when they feel something, when they have vision complaints, they cannot do regular things, they cannot drive. So that's quite late because of course, we will have a lot of uh, signs in the retina. And of course, the problem with costs are really important because uh, those cameras I was mentioning are not cheap in general. There are cheaper versions, but in general, it's going to cost. And also the arrangement and all the people working for this screening, it's also costly. But now with um, AI and deep learning um, protocols, I think we can uh, really adopt these screening tools for more people. So we can go for a uh, wider um, population. So I think that these um, AI tools are going to really help us a lot in the screening. But when looking at uh, retinography, what are we looking for? Well, the first thing we are looking for, of course, are microaneurysms. Those are the first sign we can see. We look for hemorrhages, venous beating, exudates, intraretinal microvascular abnormalities. Those are the classic findings of diabetic retinopathy. And normally we use color fundus imaging or dilated fundus examination in order to evaluate that. It's not the same having all these uh, circinate of uh, hard exudates pointing towards the fovea because we know we should treat this patient with macular edema. We have hemorrhages, there's laser there, cotton Buddha spots, more cotton Buddha spots here in the patient in the center with uh, um, less hemorrhages, but also microaneurysms and uh, some tiny exudates there. But if we look careful, we should really look for all these abnormalities and check up if those are proliferation or 
micro, uh, intraretinal microvascular abnormalities. And if we look closely to the fovea, sometimes we can also even see in these uh, retinographies the cystic spaces, so edema, okay? So those are all the things, proliferation, edema, that we are looking for. Again, this patient, it's not the same. We have this band of fibrotic tissue above the retina with these hemorrhagic signs, more massive here in the uh, image in the uh, right, where we can see this pseudo hypopion appearance of this hemorrhage, uh, meaning that it's in between the posterior hyaloid and the retina. And this is going to be proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy. So we need to urgently treat these patients. So not only we look for microaneurysms and all these classic signs, but we also should lo be looking for macular edema, neovascularization, vitro macular traction, and retinal ischemia, because all these things are going to really change the prognosis in our patients, and they are going to also change the way we treat our patients. And how we see these signs. Well, we are lucky as retina specialists because we have a lot of tools. We have color fundus, but we have also dyed base angiography with fluorescein angiography, mainly for uh, this condition. We have OCT and OCTA. That's it's it, it has changed completely the way we see our patients. And I'm going to also focus a lot on OCT and OCT and geography because uh, I think it's really important for the management uh, of our patients. So let's start with the classic, color fundus and fluorescein and geography. Not talking about ultra wide field, but we will uh, also touch this topic, but in general, color and fluorescein and geography. With color fundus photography, we have the classification of diabetic retinopathy. And this was really based on a modified uh, classification of the early house uh, classification. And it's uh, now the most uh, widely used, especially in clinical trials, is the ETDRS uh, trial um, classification. Problem with this classification of 12 steps and a lot of levels, is that it's really complicated for a daily practice. We don't have the time to carefully, well, we should carefully review our patients, but we don't have the time to carefully classify with all this detail. So nowadays, the classification that it's widely used is the international classification. And this is uh, where we separate, no, this is visible, then, mild pro non-proliferative disease, moderate non-proliferative disease, severe non-proliferative disease, and proliferative disease. And that's normally what we do in the clinic. It's non-proliferative with mild, moderate, or severe degree, or it's proliferative. And based on that, we change and assess the management of these patients. And the good thing is that both classifications, but especially the international, which is the clinical one, uh, the one that we use in daily clinic, real life, not in clinical trials, uh, where uh, ETDRS is more used, those classifications are reproducible. They're really well validated. We have a lot of data, a lot of historical data on this, and they are robust in order to predict important outcomes of our patients. Problem is that we have a lot of limitations. They only rely on the seven fields of the ETDRS. So that means only about 30% of the area of the retina. They don't really predict for the incidence of diabetic macular edema. They mainly predict for the proliferation, but we don't really account for diabetic macular edema um, uh, prognosis. So, and that's the most common cause of visual decline in our patients with diabetes, and that's important. 
They also don't include functional data, so um, no visual acuity or no other functional data. They don't really include as classification or early changes, these neural or neurodegeneration changes that could happen even earlier than the vascular changes. And also when we treat patients right now, we have seen that we can regress the degree of diabetic retinopathy. If we treat with laser, uh, uh, with PRP, a uh, proliferative condition and the new vessels regress or we had a new vessel, but we treated with uh, anti-VEF and they regressed, that's not really uh, included in uh, this classification. We cannot really um, note that in order to be aware uh, of these things. So those are important limitations to be uh, aware of. And the other important things uh, regarding classification is the field of view. It's not the same using a 45 uh, degree uh, photograph where we can see in this case that we have really here an area uh, that we should highlight. It's better to have a wider area, but uh, still it's uh, those um, ETDRS and international, they will be based on this kind of area. So about 30% of the retina and not the white periphery. So why? what about the white periphery? So for example, this patient uh, with diabetes mellitus type one uh, for 40 years, uh, not especially good control. And we can see just mild hemorrhages, some microaneurysms, no exudates. If we increase the field of view, we just see one hemo in each eye and maybe a tiny one here. So probably we will all uh, set up and degree this one as mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But if we increase even more the field of view, we can see that we have a lot of hemorrhages, especially in the far periphery. And this will end up being a moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is the fluorescein angiography where we can see more microaneurysms, of course. We can see uh, also microaneurysms more in the periphery and start to see some areas of capillary closure, especially in the far periphery. So increasing the field of view is always important and also having fluorescein angiography is going to help us in. Uh, increasing the number of signs we see. This is the uh, phobia for the same patient where we are not really expecting to have a lot of things. Visual equity was 2020, so really good uh, in the center, but mainly uh, diabetic retinopathy in the periphery. Is that important? Well, the, thing, the um, answer is, of course, it's important. With ultra wide field imaging uh, protocols, we can uh, have uh, image uh, about 12 uh, degree, uh, uh, 200 degrees of the retina. So that's about 80% uh, of the retina. Either with one shot in some devices, limited devices, but mainly with montage of these uh, images. So we can be really wide in the retina. It, they could be used for screening, because especially many of these uh, prototypes and, and devices, they work with no madrasis. And uh, as I was mentioning, you can do a single image with 1200, uh, 200, but not uh, every device could do that. But montage can allow us to see bigger uh, pictures. And uh, the thing is that if you analyze and classify diabetic retinopathy comparing ultra wide field imaging compared to the seven uh, ETDRS field, uh, you will see that for, uh, 15 per, uh, percent of patients have greater uh, stage of diabetic retinopathy when grading also the periphery as we saw in the uh, case I was showing. And what happens with those patients that have 
predominantly peripheral lesions. So those are patients that are at higher risk because those lesions are 50%. So half of the lesions are outside the area of the ETD arrests and they have uh, increased uh, progression risk for uh, uh, developing and uh, progressing two steps of diabetic retinopathy in uh, four years. And also uh, uh, 4.7 uh, increased risk for progression to proliferative diabetic retinopathy in four years. So that's a big number and it's uh, important to, to really be aware of that. Okay, so those patients really mild with far periphery involved, be aware that they could really progress worse than those with signs in the center. Let's see another example. Uh, this example shows already exudates here, some hemo, uh, some uh, aneurysm here, and some changes uh, here too. And if we see uh, the uh, white field image, we can see more hemorrhages. Uh, here another area with some funny shape vessels. Always look for this funny shape. We It could be neovascularization and uh, proliferation, or it could be intraretinal microvascular abnormalities. So we should really be careful uh, on seeing that. Fluorescein angiography, of course, is going to add a lot of information. We can see really clear that those funny shaped vessels were new vessels leaking. So uh, it's really important. Also, uh, fluorescein angiography allowed us to see a lot of patchy areas of ischemia in the periphery. So uh, it's really uh, important. This is a fellow eye where we can also see all these areas of new vessels with leaking uh, in the uh, middle and late phases. And again, a lot of areas with ischemia. So wide field and ultra wide field uh, fluorescein angiography, it's really helping a lot uh, because they provide uh, with additional and complementary information to the uh, color fundus. And uh, this was uh, analyzed by the protocol AA by the uh, DRCRnet. Um, and they uh, concluded that ultra wide field fluorescein angiography complement uh, the color fundus photography. And uh, if you have greater baseline uh, retinal areas of non perfusion, and uh, these lesions are predominantly peripheral, uh, those patients are associated with higher risk uh, of disease worsening. This is also in four years. So, uh, this additional information has prognostic information for our patients, so it's really important. And what about other modalities? So this is OCT complementing. We don't have edema. That's good. But what do, else do you see? I'm going to stop a little bit so I can drink and breathe, uh, but you think on the things you see in the OCT. And we see other things. We see this area of thinning, retinal thinning, and this should always pop up in our mind when we are looking at diabetic people, but we also see this area of thickening of the posterior haloid. This is not thickening, this is proliferation. So if this is new vessels, okay? Neovascularization in the retina, it's always going to show up above the retina. And normally with uh, the posterior haloid being as an escaphold for all these new vessels growing in the surface of the retina. So OCT, we are mainly using OCT for evaluating edema. There is fluid, no fluid, thickening. Okay, but we have a lot of other things that we can see at the uh, uh, OCT. Of course, the thickening could be linked to the areas of leaking and uh, edema in fluorescein angiography. This was uh, really studied at the beginning of the OCT when we were starting uh, to use OCT in daily practice. And we can guide even uh, photocoagulation or uh, uh, treatment with anti-VEF with this um, 
uh, OCT, of course, but it's also important to have an idea or on how we are classifying this maculopathy, so diabetic macular edema. As it was happening with um, diabetic retinopathy, we were using only color fundus photography at the beginning um, with this clinically significant macular edema in the uh, center of 500, uh, 500 microns uh, centrally in the macula, clinically uh, non-significant when it was outside, but also with fluorescent angiography, we could subclassify in focal, multifocal, diffuse um, um, areas, but with OCT, we could be really precise, quantifying the amount of thickening and also locating really precisely this um, edema. Macular edema was classified uh, really, uh, this, one, this was one of the widely used uh, uh, classifications by Panozzo in 2004. But I think it was quite complicated and that's why normally it's not implemented in the clinic. We don't really assess the morphology or the traction. We assess in a different way instead of uh, pointing and uh, numbering uh, all this assessment. They have uh, really updated this classification by uh, Panozzo and the Esasso group. But again, I mean, you have to assess the thickening and uh, gray dot, the cysts, the and gray dot, the ellipsoid zone and the elix, external limiting membrane status and gray dot, the presence of drill or not, hyperreflective foci, subretinal fluid, traction. And at the end, you have to point too many things in order to stage diabetic uh, macular edema in early, advanced, severe, or atrophic. So I think uh, the problem with this detailed and super strict um, classification is that you have to point too many things and in a BC clinic, maybe you don't have the time to do that. That's why we proposed a uh, long time ago, this classification thinking more on how we think as clinicians. So normally in order to treat edema, we think if there's central involvement or not, if it's peripheral or it's central or it's marginal because you can maybe treat it with laser. If it's the extension, it's really white or uh, less white. And especially the presence of traction because if there's traction, we can maybe uh, choose these patients for um, vitro retinal surgery. But my point here was that I think is there's less standardization in the diabetic uh, macular edema uh, classification compared to the diabetic retinopathy. And this is an example of the proposed international uh, classification, but it's just quite simple. So uh, presence of or absence of um, edema and just uh, the, you grade in mild, moderate or severe. But this is based on color from this photography. So uh, you miss a lot of, uh, of the details that Panozzo was um, proposing. <clears throat> and what are those details that we can see with OCT and OCT angiography? We can analyze, of course, the location. Uh, super, uh, fluid could be intraretinal fluid within the layers of the retina, or it could be subretinal. We can also have a hyperreflective material within the cysts. So not all the fluid is going to be hyperreflective. And also we can have confluent cystic spaces. So it's not the same having just some uh, tiny uh, cysts around the fovea that are having larger cysts here. You can see that in this, uh, area or this one, the content of the cyst is more hyper um, uh, reflective compared to other areas where it's hypo. Is this important? Well, yeah, that means that the content is different. And we are going to see that it could appear different in OCT angiography. We will see. And what about the confluence? It's not the same having this huge cystic uh, uh, space compared to having just uh, some little uh, cystic spaces 
uh, with uh, a more uh, preserved anatomy of the retina. And if we look at additional information that the OCT angiography provides, this confluent central uh, cyst with a lot of uh, uh, dimension, diameter, are normally associated with an uh, art, um, uh, no preservation of the foveal vascular zone. So this uh, loss of the circularity of the foveal vascular zone and signs of ischemia in the OCT angiography allows us to really diagnose this uh, uh, capillary dropout uh, in these patients. But we can suspect that when seeing these confluent cystic spaces. This is the intermediate plexus and the deep capillar plexus showing also this uh, loss uh, of capillary uh, perfusion. The other sign that we should really look for is disorganization of the internal retinal layers. And if you see above, we have a lot of signs of ischemia, so thinning of the retina, but we can still uh, draw the retinal layers in this patient. But if you look at the patient below, we see thinning, but we cannot really separate and define the layers. So this is drill, okay? This organization of the internal retinal layers is like highlighting all the hyperaffective uh, content and not being able to differentiate between the different layers of the retina, okay? It becomes all like a mass with no uh, edges and uh, sublayers. And the disorganization of the outer retinal layers, it could be uh, called droll, or also normally it's reflected as uh, the uh, presence or preservation or disruption of the ELM and the ellipsoid zone. So external limiting membrane and ellipsoid zone of the photoreceptors are the most important um, prognostic factors for the visual acuity in our patients because of uh, this disruption in the of the outer retinal layers, okay? Could also be a refer as droll. As you can see here in both examples. And this is another example where we can see that it's really difficult to differentiate between layers in this patient. So we have drill, but also we have uh, some disorganization of the retina, uh, outer retina, especially in the uh, image below, where we have, can have all this hyperreflective uh, material and uh, all the uh, disruption of the external limiting membrane and the ellipsoid zone. And what about the content? I was mentioning before that we can have this high pore reflective content or this high pair reflective content. And this is uh, due to the presence of lipoproteins and uh, different aspects. So in OCTA, we will have this cystoid space with no uh, flow sign, but sometimes we have this mild flow sign in these areas of the cyst and that's because some of this content in the cyst, it's moving because of these lipoproteins, they are moving around in the cyst, within the cyst. And this has been described as spin. Let's see another example. So this is pseudo flow. It's not flow of the uh, blood cells in the vessel, but it's something moving within the retina that it's not uh, blood. It's just the uh, uh, content of the cyst. If we look at the uh, B scan, not the unfast visualization, we can clearly see that some cysts are high pore reflective and we don't have any movement there, but those with high per uh, reflective content, they can show this flow signal, non related to uh, movement of blood cells. Again, movement just of the lipoproteins within the cystic space. And this uh, is the same patient with the uh, superficial vascular plexus, uh, the intermediate capillary plexus, and the uh, deep capillary plexus, where we can clearly see all the cystic spaces with this pseudo flow. And this, again, is being uh, called SPIM, suspended scattering particles in motion, because are, those are 
particles that are moving within the cyst, but not blood. And this is another example where you can see that the fovea is preserved. You can have a nice capillary uh, perfusion. Also here, fovea is preserved, but you have this all this area of pseudo flow. This doesn't really correspond to any vascular um, structure. It's just uh, a cyst. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. With some um, hyper-effective content. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what about this uh, patient? This is the uh, superficial, but vascular complex, sorry. Superficial vascular complex, this uh, deep capillary complex, and this is the vitreous um, area. And this is important to know because uh, patients with diabetes may have neovascularization. And this is the slab in the OCTA that we are going to see uh, when we are analyzing the presence of new vessels. But sometimes we have the posterior hyoid just detaching or almost detached from the retina, but attached to the optic nerve head. And with the saccade movements of the eye, we can have some mild movements. So we can have these areas of pseudo flow. So it will be same as pseudo flow, so movement like we described in the spin, but related to the posterior hyaloid, which is a tissue that it's moving itself in a different way than the retina is. So always important to only not only analyze the AMFAS reconstruction of the OCT angiography, but also the BS scan with flow overlay, because we are going to really understand a lot of this uh, condition. We don't see really thickening here. so. There's no way there's vessels there, okay? If we are not really sure, we could also perform a fluorescent angiography to see if there's leakage or not in a mild area there. What about microaneurysms? Is there any importance to look at those microaneurysms in the OCT? Well, we can really analyze a lot of things in microaneurysms, especially the contour, because normally, when contour is really uh, hyperreflective and continuous, those are uh, normally microaneurysms that are not leaking. But when we start to see this, uh, we lost this continuity and we uh, start to see patchy areas of hypo um, reflective contour, those are normally associated with cystic spaces. So those are uh, microaneurysms that are going to leak. And this was also published long time ago um, uh, by uh, Dr. Hori and uh, colleagues. Uh, and they described this rhyme sign that we should look for in uh, microaneurysms because when we lose this rhyme sign, uh, uh, ring sign, uh, then we have uh, these leaky uh, microaneurysms. We can also analyze these leaky aneurysms in an unfast way, so in a transverse uh, position uh, with the OCT. Again, if we see a really hyperreflective structure, really um, homogeneous, it's non-leaky uh, microaneurysms, but if we start losing this hyperreflective um, contour and a structure, those are the ones that are leaking. And we can also nowadays com uh, combine not only a structural OCT, but also OCT angiography. So we can see which of these microaneurysms are perfused and which are non-perfused or partially non-perfused. So we have a lot of information of these microaneurysms. <clears throat> what about heart exudates? Well, we uh, could be seeing uh, the earliest stages of hexadates as hyperreflective foci. 
But also we should be really worrying when all these hard exudates are pointing towards the fovea because we know that uh, if they deposit in the fovea, they can do this kind of proliferation that I was showing before uh, with the droll, with the disorganization of the ultra retinal layers. And this is really uh, uh, important because it's going to decrease the visual acuity in our patients dramatically. <clears throat> And ischemia, can we really assess ischemia with OCT? Normally we talked about fluorescein angiography. And of course, if you want to analyze the um, periphery, uh, it's sometimes faster and better to do fluorescein angiography, but ischemia could be really analyzed with OCT and now with OCT angiography too. Let's see at OCT. Uh, we can analyze cotton bud spots and uh, uh, paramacular uh, middle maculopathy, um, paracentral middle maculopathy, PAM lesions that are going to uh, be affecting the intermediate layers of the retina. And this is the early sign or acute sign of ischemia, hyperreflectivity of the layers. When this acute phase uh, is uh, fading and we have the chronic phase, we will have thinning of the retina. And that's what we were seeing before in other cases I was showing. So acute, you will have uh, hyperreflectivity, but then when you have this disorganization and this irregularity of the outer nuclear layer, this means that all these areas are affected by ischemia in the deep uh, complex. And this is in combination with multicolor because it's also uh, useful in the differentiation of the level of the ischemia. With OCT, we can see that the hyperreflectivity it's in the nerve fiber layer. So this is superficial ischemia, cotton wood spots. In the fundus, we will see a patchy whitish area, but also multicolor is showing really white um, lesion here. With the multicolor in a PAM, in a paracentral acute middle maculopathy, we can see a grayish appearance. Uh, it's not that white. It's not covering uh, vessels. So it's more in the middle of the retina um, layers. <clears throat> and the OCT also highlights that with only hyperreflectivity in the middle layers and this uh, highlight of the external uh, plexiform layer. And this is the chronic stage. We were talking about hyperreflectivity of the layers. Now we are only seeing thinning. When we see patchy areas of thinning of both the internal and middle layers, we know we have uh, superficial, intermediate, and deep capillary plexus affected. When we only see aff uh, affected the outer nuclear layer with this color shape, um, uh, irregularities, it's more on the deep. But sometimes we have this mix of uh, inter, uh, uh, superficial and deep uh, retinal circulation. And this, all these uh, cases are showing the same patchy areas of thinning. So whenever we are evaluating if a patient uh, with diabetes has edema, we can also evaluate if we see any of these irregularities because those are really signs of ischemia and those are really common. common. <clears throat> but also we can use the uh, thickness map. And thickness maps are really useful. Uh, it's just an unfast view, and we have these bluish areas. So retina should be more grayish and somehow um, uh, or uh, yellow around the um, central area of the macula. But if we see these areas of blue in the thickness map, we can correlate directly with OCT angiography, and we will see these areas of capillary dropout. So uh, we have ischemia, okay? So this is another way to visualize these areas of thinning with a B-scan in a faster uh, image, uh, just looking at the thickness uh, map. And look carefully at this thickness map. So sometimes we are just looking for thickening, okay? So 
this um, uh, orange, reddish, even white uh, color. But we can also check this area of thinning, so bluish uh, area. But look at this tiny area of thickening next to the ischemia. So this is quite suspicious, OK? Because we have ischemia, but we have something growing there. So something that the thickness map is going to show because we have neovascularization. So OCT careful analysis could be really useful uh, in order to maybe avoid uh, fluorescent angiography because we already know that this patient has proliferation. Okay, and it's going to change completely our management. This is another example where we can see these areas of ischemia in the OCT angiography that are going to uh, be areas of thinning. And again, this is a patient with fluorescein angiography and patchy area of um, ischemia here. And we can see that the ischemia corresponds to an area of thinning, so bluish uh, uh, color there. So again, ischemia really important uh, to be analyzed also, not only in fluorescein angiography, but also OCT and OCT angiography. And what about proliferation? Okay, It has two uh, functions. We can plan the surgery if our patient requires surgery because uh, it's uh, at high risk of uh, detachment or traction, but also we can differentiate new vessels from intraretinal uh, vascular abnormalities. So new vessels are going to grow above the retina and uh, uh, intraretinal uh, microvascular abnormalities are going to stay in the retina, within the retina. So those are both funny shaped um, vessels uh, in the fundus, but with an OCT over these uh, vessels, we can um, differentiate. So proliferation and new, uh, new vessels are going to be always above. And we can carefully uh, check in, in, uh, with uh, infrared image fluorescein angiography, these leaky vessels, so new vessels, but we can uh, check with the OCT that always look as proliferation in the vitreous area, so above the retinal surface, and always looking the same. Okay, sometimes they have like an area of proliferation, sometimes it's more focal. And we can, with the OCT, analyze the degree of traction on the surface of the retina. So, for example, the patients uh, below in the bottom part, uh, these two patients might benefit of. Um, some kind of surgery if we think that the patient is at risk of retinal detachment. <clears throat> but it's still, um, we can analyze uh, with the OCT angiography this proliferation and uh, start treating when we see that the traction is not a problem. Uh, we start treating with anti VEF so we can resolve the macular edema without. Uh, uh, treating with surgery this patient, and that's going to uh, be better uh, if we want to continue keeping treatment with anti-VEF. And what about ultra wide field OCT angiography? This is a really trending topic, uh, but sometimes it's really trending topic. It's cool images, but in the clinic has also some limitations. Uh, it's good to have this image, but it's going to take quite a lot of time because a uh, patient uh, should be uh, helping because it's a montage of different uh, images uh, or this or the one with proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy. But if we want to analyze even further uh, uh, the retina, we become to have problems in the segmentation because of the shape of the uh, eyeball. And uh, this is an issue when we want to really analyze if there's ischemia in the periphery, because uh, we don't really want to have issues with segmentation. Uh, we want to be sure if there's ischemia or not. So sometimes it will be easier to per perform a classic fluorescein angiography. Again, this is an area of uh, ischemia, but I don't know the extent of this ischemia in the periphery because uh, it's uh, really masked with other artifacts of the OCT angiography. 
So I'm coming just uh, to uh, the end of uh, this uh, talk and I want to summarize with this paper. And I think this is the consensus that uh, internationally uh, they have uh, uh, achieved. Uh, and they think that a standard color fundus photography, a standard fluorescent angiography, and even ultra wide field fluorescent angiography, we have level one evidence of the use for classifying and um, uh, staging uh, diabetic retinopathy, but we need more evidence uh, with other modalities. So nowadays, uh, in order to analyze uh, the retina, we have a lot of information with color uh, photography, especially uh, standard. Um, we also have uh, standard FA and uh, um, ultra wide field fluorescing angiography, we need more fundus and especially OCT angiography. And that's why, because, well, color fundus photography uh, with the standard uh, field of view is cheaper. It's really nearly universally adopted for a screening and um, diagnosis of diabetes. So this is the way that we should be working uh, still. So it's not really old fashioned, it's still uh, up to date and we can use it. Uh, it's true that if we do montage of the seven uh, uh, field um, uh, ETDRS, we can also assess the periphery and uh, know if uh, this uh, additional information is uh, important, okay? Because we know additional information from the periphery, as I mentioned before, has prognostic um, uh, value. But especially adding prognostic information with ultra wide field fluorescent angiography could be really important because it's really assessing the, uh, uh, um, the progression into uh, um, advanced forms um, in really an important way and complementary to the color from those images. And for OCT angiography, although it's a non invasive, um, non -invasive uh, uh, um, modality, it's true that it has a lot of limitations. So it's still, uh, it's promising, but it's still uh, we have to learn a lot uh, from this technique. I just want to show uh, the last case because I think this is the way I, at least I work in the clinic. I use uh, ultra wide field or wide field uh, color images uh, to do the staging and I use ultra wide field fluorescent angiography uh, because it's helping a lot in the uh, planning of the uh, laser and also in the staging with uh, additional uh, prognostic information. So I always use uh, this ultra wide field. And uh, one of the things that I really uh, well, sometimes you can highlight uh, these new vessels uh, with green reflectance. Um, and what I really use a lot is OCT follow-up over these areas of new vessels because it's helping me a lot to see the uh, progression when uh, we uh, perform treatment, even with laser or anti-DEF. Um, and we can also do that not only with the structural OCT, but also with the OCT A and showing this nice regression of the new vessels. So it's really uh, helping me a lot. And I use a lot of detailed information of these uh, diabetes. So my last slide will be a quick checklist for these diabetic patients. What the, are the things that we look for? Uh, changes uh, in the OCT angiography with all this deep ischemia, uh, especially. We also uh, check up and differentiate proliferative and non-proliferative uh, diseases with color fundus and fluorescent angiography, ultra wide field. And of course, we should check with the traction, uh, if there's traction with the OCT. For diabetic macular edema, if there's central involvement or not, of course, only with the OCT and detailed evaluation of the internal and external uh, retinal layers. And again, if there is presence of uh, traction. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, now I think we can move on to the uh, questions. First, uh, we have a question of how we can avoid the neovascular risk and complications. 
So um, we kind of really avoid it, but uh, that's why I highlighted that the earlier we diagnose diabetes and the earlier we start with this patient within a pro uh, project or a protocol of screening, the better, because we are going to really uh, detect changes earlier and we can prepare uh, or we can change treatment uh, for better uh, uh, glycemic control and uh, we can schedule the patient uh, in a different way. So for those with mild diabetic non-proliferated uh, non diabetic retinopathy, those could be seen uh, yearly, but those with signs of uh, moderate to severe, we can schedule in a different uh, way. Uh, what is the fate of diabetic uh, retinopathy uh, proliferation, I think? Um, you mean the rate, I think? So the rate, so uh, side threatening um, diabetic uh, complications are about 11% of diabetic uh, patients, but those uh, not only include uh, proliferation, but also diabetic uh, uh, macular edema, okay? So diabetic macular edema, in fact, is um, the uh, most frequent cause of uh, uh, vision, vision loss in our patients. Uh, how long does it normally take uh, for systemic diabetic, uh, diabetes cause diabetic retinopathy? So uh, it depends on the type of uh, diabetes. So right now, protocol says that when you diagnose um, type 1 diabetes, since the diagnosis normally it's um, when the uh, disease uh, has started, you can wait for up to five years in order to do the screening. But when you uh, diagnose a type two uh, diabetic patient, you should start a screening protocols as soon as you diagnose that because you are not really, you couldn't be sure of when the disease has started, okay? But normally, uh, yeah, um, it could be like about five years, but it's that's an estimate uh, based on uh, the schedule of the um, uh, screening protocols. What is the side effect of edema in age uh, diabetic patient? Well, the side effect is that the visual acuity is really impaired when there is central involvement and we should treat it uh, as soon as possible. Um, if central, if there's central involvement, anti-VEF drugs uh, will be the first option in general, unless they are non-responsive where we have also corticosteroids. Uh, apart from the retina, is there any ocular sign that it's uh, seen in diabetes? Uh, can hyperglycemia cause Sandy sensation due to poor tear film, and can it uh, be used as one of the ways of detecting diabetes? So I will not say um, patients with diabetes have um, more symptoms of the dry eye. In fact, I will say they have less because normally they have uh, problems with um, sensory nerves, uh, but they can also develop cataracts earlier. So uh, that's another complication in the eye. Um, and uh, they can also uh, have dry eye, but I will not say sandy or like itchy feeling or um, uh, foreign body feeling. It's a way of diagnosing diabetes. Uh, they should do blood test and that's uh, probably the best way. Uh, what are the complications? Um, I don't know what are you uh, you're referring, um, mute, uh, Dr. Mute. So if you can uh, reframe the uh, the question. So um, what are the usual complications after the surgery? Uh, well, I don't know what surgery are you referring to, but uh, if you mean the vitro retinal surgery, normally um, there's no really complication. But uh, when I was referring to avoiding doing uh, vitro retinal surgery in patients undergoing uh, treatment with anti-VEF is because if the patient is uh, uh, with bitrectomy, the uh, effect of the uh, anti-VEF drug may last less. That's why. 
but there's no other uh, complication. How can we differentiate an exudate from a drusen on imaging the retina? Uh, so normally exudates, um, uh, heart exudates are a round uh, vessel or a microaneurysm, and uh, they form this uh, circular um, appearance or they point towards uh, some direction, uh, especially the phobia. And drusen normally, the classic soft drusen are located in the macula and the color is uh, more whitish with a round, uh, round contour. Uh, the acetazolamine for DME, well, uh, if you don't have anything else, you can try, but I will even try, uh, uh, I don't know, um, it, uh, a steroid, uh, even uh, periocular uh, instead of acetylsolamide because there's no uh, probably much effect. Injectable insulin in the progression of DR. So the better the control is, uh, the systemic control, uh, the better because um, we can, um, uh, yeah, uh, control better the progression. But uh, you should treat uh, no matter what happens with the metabolic and glycemic control of the patient. The if the control is better, your the the prognosis of the patient uh, long term is going to be better, of course. Uh, why kidney disease is considered as risk of for the progression of re uh, diabetic retinopathy? Uh, so uh, the thing is that if you have also kidney disease, uh, it's um, a meaning that uh, you have um, a lot of impairment uh, of the microvascular structures in your body in general. So uh, those are patients at higher risk uh, for progression. Can you suggest latest treatment? Uh, well, um, latest treatment, I will, my first option is al always anti-VEF, um, and we have many options right now uh, approved for diabetic macular edema. And uh, if there is no response, um, uh, I'm talking about diabetic macular edema, if there is no response, uh, you can also uh, complement with steroids and also you can lose, uh, use um, some laser treatment when you have uh, this peripheral uh, areas of thickening. And for uh, diabetic retinopathy, I normally use, uh, I still keep using a uh, laser. Uh, it is, is it possible to have no signs of diabetic retinopathy even after 25 years of, yeah, of diabetes? Uh, of course, there are patients that never develop uh, diabetic retinopathy because uh, the control is good. Uh, in fact, it's estimated that the uh, prevalence of diabetic retinopathy is about 35% of the overall uh, diabetic population. How do you incorporate visual, visual function and neurodegenerative changes as part of the preclinical uh, diabetic retinopathy monitoring? Um, uh, so visual function, uh, normally we use um, visual equity and uh, nothing else because uh, in a daily clinic, you don't have time to include uh, contrast sensitivity, reading speed uh, and other tests or even visual field, um, but uh, it will be interesting. And there are a lot of uh, uh, papers uh, on this topic. For the neurodegenerative, you can assess the thickness of the ganglion cell layers, for example, because uh, there is a, a, an involvement of this uh, layer uh, in uh, diabetic patients. For how long are anti-VF injected in diabetic macroedema? Uh, forever and ever, but um, pay, uh, the requirement of anti-VEF is decreasing over time. So normally it's about a mean number of seven injections in the first year, about four uh, injections in the second year, uh, two injections, uh, three in the third year. So it's really um, behaving better and better. And uh, this uh, is uh, when you are using uh, treat and extend protocol, which is my preferred uh, protocol for treatment with anti-VEF right now. 
do you observe uh, macular edema or treat of vision if vision is good? Um, uh, so if vision is good, um, I really trust. That's the main difference with um, um, uh, AMD, with uh, it related to macular degeneration. So here in uh, the diabetes, we, achieve, we want to achieve the um, good vision. Uh, even when some sometimes we have a little bit of fluid, visual acuity could be uh, 20, 20. So I will not start vision uh, treatment, sorry, with visual acuity 2020. 20. I will observe. Do you recommend routine um, ultra wide field fundus photography like optos for diabetic retinopathy? Uh, so if you can uh, have uh, optos or other uh, ultra wide field color image. I think it's useful in general uh, for screening nevi, uh, choroidal nevi, or um, a peripheral tear. Uh, so it's useful not only for diabetic retinopathy, but in general uh, to assess quickly the the retina anomaly without uh, midriasis, so no dilation. So yeah, I will recommend. How to know artifacts from ischemia in OCTA? Well, that's tricky, but I will suggest always um, look for segmentation on the B scan, not only the AMFAS visualization. So always check AMFAS, so transverse, but also the B scans, so OCT with flow overlay. Are uh, there any studies in genetic defect or genetic variations associated with uh, diabetic retinopathy where uh, I've mainly talked about uh, diabetic retinopathy type two and also type one, but there are uh, some variations and uh, rare uh, variants of diabetes that are uh, genetically variants. So uh, yeah. How to minimize the artifacts uh, maybe for OCTA? Well, um, I think all the companies are working on that, uh, but uh, it's a tricky um, uh, technique. So it's a quite uh, complicated to really segment all the retina with the shape of uh, the retina. So, but uh, technology is becoming better and better. What are your expectations toward optometrist role when uh, they are seeing diabetic patients? So I think uh, I didn't, uh, well, I included optometrist because depending on the country, uh, they really work as a primary care uh, for those patients. But uh, I think um, I don't have any particular expectation because it doesn't really depend on me. I think they work a lot and they, uh, if we work together with them, uh, it's better as ophthalmologists uh, because uh, they have a lot of population uh, in their hands and they can do a lot of good work for screening of these important uh, conditions. Is there any alternative to PRP? Yeah, you can uh, use anti-VF, um, but uh, then the patient uh, should be going normally monthly to your clinic. So um, it's really costly, uh, So, but it depends. Uh, maybe uh, some patients will benefit of this anti-VF uh, treatment. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I love to know what camera do you use in taking uh, images? Well, um, I work with um, um, Spectralis uh, uh, from Heidelberg um, and normally perform fluorescent geography with that uh, and OCT and OCTA. And for a wide field color image, I use the Clarus um, from Sight. Uh, diabetic macular edema and anti-VGF with uh, which anti-VGF good if intravitreal and stereo is not working? Is there any new treatment for diabetic macular edema? Well, uh, the most recent is farisimab uh, from Roche uh, that it's now approved at least in uh, Europe for uh, diabetic macular edema. So that will be the latest. Another options that are on the pipeline are um, um, for example, the PDS, the, the um, 
uh, the platform that uh, you inject in Parse Plana and you can refill with Rani Visumap and it's going to uh, uh, um, release uh, slowly the drug uh, over time. The port delivery system, yep. Which molecule uh, prescribed to treat? Well, uh, the good thing is that uh, right now we have um, uh, Bevaz, uh, well, we don't use, I don't use in the clinic Bevazizumab, but we have Bevazizumab, we have Ranivizumab, we have a flavor sept, and we have um, um, Farizumab. So you have a lot of options. Also, you have all the steroids. So uh, it's good to have many options so you can uh, choose depending on your patients. Uh, what is the treatment modality for subhaloid hemorrhage? Uh, well, it depends on um, the degree and if you have treated already with PRP or not, uh, and you have traction or not. So it's not only subhyaloid hemorrhage per se, but um, you have to really assess uh, the presence of traction, risk for retinal detachment uh, before uh, deciding if you want to do PRP, so just laser, or you want to uh, really assess with uh, surgery. Uh, is using angiotensin converting enzyme uh, really effective in showing the uh, slowing the progression of uh, diabetic retinopathy? Um, I don't uh, really know. Uh, so, um, but uh, probably. Um, if there's data uh, on the endocrinology side, uh, it could be. After anti-VGF injection, which is the best uh, in follow-up color fundus, OCT or OCTA? Uh, well, if you want to check up uh, for edema, um, I will go for OCT. OCTA could be useful in order to assess uh, ischemia. And uh, color fundus, it's always um, good to have. So I will do everything, but uh, OCT, of course. How do you differentiate uh, neovascularization of the disc versus neovascularization um, and IRMA? Uh, so clinically, with OCT, I will say, um, uh, OCT is really useful, but of course, uh, you have uh, angiography. And normally at baseline, of, for sure, you should perform a uh, ferritin angiography if you're uh, suspecting uh, proliferation because uh, you cannot really assess all the areas of neovascularization and urma with OCT. It will take a lot of time. But once you have uh, some patchy areas of neovascularization, uh, my point was that you can follow up with OCT so, to see the regression. And it's another way to have uh, information of this uh, over uh, time. But for baseline, I will say uh, it's better a fluorescein angiography. And for follow up, you can follow up with OCT. In the UK, we are uh, limited uh, to PRP for PDR uh, and can only use anti-VAF therapy if PDR persists despite complete PRP. Uh, yeah, that's uh, no, I mean, we are not that limited. So you could be able to choose in Spain, but uh, it's mostly, uh, I think it's most uh, if, uh, costly efficient. Uh, so, um, because you do PRP and normally uh, it's going to regress uh, um, uh, in every case. So, yeah, it's kind of the same. It's not a lot. I don't know a lot of people treating with anti-VEF, the uh, uh, PDR. When not to prescribe glasses for a diabetic person, um, well, if if the patient is going to underwent um, undergo a cataract surgery, maybe it's not the best option. You should wait. And uh, if it's not, there's a lot of edema and you're going to start treating, then you should wait also. So once you require treatment because there's uh, some complication, maybe you should wait a little bit and then um, prescribe the glasses after the procedure. That's a threshold micro... Uh, Second pulse diode laser has a role in uh, DME. Well, I think it's less and less used, but maybe you have um, some tiny microaneurysm leaking and uh, 
you don't have a really diffuse or a central involved, maybe it, there's a still some role. How many years uh, it takes to develop a proliferative after onset? We already uh, mentioned that um, um, uh, before, maybe up to uh, five, but uh, it's just an speculation based on the screening. Um, why we look for a diabetic retinopathy in peripheral retina? There is there is no risk in vision. Yeah, of course, there is no risk in vision, but we've seen with the AA uh, protocol of the RCR net and before with uh, many other uh, publications uh, long-term, like uh, uh, following uh, for at least four years diabetic patients, that all these additional information and these uh, predominantly peripheral lesions in diabetic patients they really uh, uh, give us prognostic information because they increase the risk for progression into um, proliferative stage. And they also increase the risk for uh, advancing two steps on the uh, diabetic retinopathy stage. So um, there's no vision per se, but uh, there's a vision risk because the progression of uh, a stage of the diabetic retinopathy. Do you regularly apply laser to the new vessels itself or just around? I just do PRP, not, not treating the new vessels itself. In fact, what you're treating is the ischemia, the ischemic uh, lesions around normally. For how long do we have to continue giving anti-VEF or is there any criteria to this continue giving it? Um, well, I don't, I don't think you should uh, stop it unless it's really benign, but it's true that you need less and less. So uh, that's a tricky uh, question because in fact, uh, that's why classifications are also limited because we don't really have information after treatment. What happens when we have regression of uh, this uh, retinopathy and we have also improvement of uh, DME, uh, how long uh, we should uh, really assess our patients and uh, in which frequency. So I think uh, there is a lot of uh, um, work on this um, uh, and we need more data for the following years. Is there a contradiction to cataract surgery, a contraindication uh, in diabetic uh, retinopathy? <clears throat> so I don't think uh, there's a contraindication. Um, if uh, there is a patient with macular edema, I will suggest uh, to perform um, uh, anti-VEF injection uh, after the surgery, but uh, within the day of the surgery, because we know that with edema and the surgery, that could be uh, worse, but um, not contraindication per se. To which extent can diabetic uh, cause myopic shift related to uh time it may take uh, so I, the thing is that uh yeah it should have uh refractive uh changes because of the uh, both the thickening and uh, thinning of the uh, lens but also if you have thickening of the um of the retina you can have a hyperopic shift so um yeah uh, there are many things you can have uh, in the refraction of patients so you should be careful that's why delaying the glasses could be related to cataract or <laughs> edema is there any way to go around classif uh, classifying the stent of diabetic retinopathy in the setting of poor fundus view <clears throat> well um at uh, the stage for no uh, so poor from this view will be even the like the um, um, more advanced stage uh, based on the ETDRS classification. If you cannot really assess the fundus because of vitreous hemorrhage, uh, then it should be really advanced. If you have cataract, I will suggest to take out the cataract before um, and then uh, grading the, the the retina. And if you uh, the cataract is so, so um, big that you cannot really see the retina. You can also perform maybe ultrasound before to be sure that you don't have uh, retinal detachments and that will require um, combined uh, vitrectomy and cataract. 
type two, uh, type two diabetes uh, mellitus uh, is on the rise and many patients are completely unaware that they have uh, this condition and diagnosis of the pathology is way late into this condition and a full uh, endocrine evaluation is needed and patient education also. Plus, well, I, there's, there's no question here. Okay, yeah, uh, systemic control, it's important and patient education, yeah. Do you think that uh, steroids could be the first line of therapy in patients with EME? Uh, not for me. I prefer anti-VEF, uh, there's an option, but I think it's more uh, safe uh, for the eye, no risk for cataract, no risk for IOP increase, um, and uh, they are really effective. So I will use it as a um, second line in uh, those refractory uh, uh, DME. For my country, can you help? With this treatment is not available in most Africa country. Ah, oh, maybe you refer to um, anti VEP and um, uh, uh, farisimab. I wish I could really help, but um, uh, I don't really know. But maybe um, Orbis and um, um, the organization can maybe help with that. In your experience, is there a definitive end to anti VEF? Once it started, not really, no. You should always keep uh, treating and um, um, checking the patients. Well, uh, perfect. So thank you so much. Um, I hope uh, you enjoyed. Um, um, uh, thank you again uh, to the Cybersight team for this opportunity and to Orbis uh, for allowing me to present today. Thank you.